Hello, and welcome to my broadcast. If you're watching for the first time, please do say hello. Let us know where you're watching from and why you've tuned into this broadcast. I'd love to know. So if you're new to this broadcast, my name is Daniela Blechner. Hey there, Leah. <laughs> my name is Daniela Blechner. I'm an author, book journey mentor, founder of a company called Conscious Dreams Publishing. We work with authors from all over the world to help to get their powerful messages and stories out there in the form of professional books. On the bookshelf behind me here are just some of the 150 plus books that we've published over the last six years. I'm absolutely passionate about providing a platform for unseen, unheard authors so they can have their stories shared and voices heard so they can inspire, educate, entertain, empower for generations to come. Now, the premise of this show really is to interview authors to really give you an insight into not just their book, but about them, those deep down, get delve deep down into to them and why they've written their book and, and who they are, but also for you to really get a, a sense of the author journey, because so often we watch, you know, we'll read a book, um, you know, we'll listen to it on Kindle, but we never really think about the story or the journey behind actually the creation of the book. It's also an opportunity. Oh, hi, Lucy, nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Uh, it's also an opportunity for you to ask uh, our author some questions as well. So it's a very interactive show. Uh, if you have any questions, want to get involved, please do feel free to do that. So today, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my awesome and amazing guest. Hello, Hendrix. I'm going to be interviewing Leah Bailey, who is publishing her third uh, poetry book with us. Leah is awesome. Her first book was called between hindsight and foresight which she published over lockdown 2020 she hey there she then went on to publish chasing apollo um it feels like it was about is in october yeah because that was the first physical launch that we'd had actually since you know post pre-lockdown and now and we've received this pr beautiful proof copy in the post just yesterday she's published coffee and paper cuts with us and she has also got her book launch in the same venue as she did in October, which also is the same place where she wrote a lot of these poems in Wimbledon in Bert Bertie's Bar. And she'll explain a little bit about that later. So without any further ado, Leah is an English teacher, same as myself, um, a spoken word poet and three time author. So I'm going to invite her into the broadcast. You pulled in my details for a friend. Okay, lovely. Thank you. I'm going to invite the lovely Leah into the broadcast right now so you can say hello. And again, if you find this of value and worth, please do tap the screen, show us some love, let us know where you're watching from, and please do share this out, share this with your network far and wide because this really is a platform where we support each other and support um the authors that you that you're that you listen to that you meet <laughs> um so as i'm speaking away i'm trying to invite leah into the instagram broadcast as well so i've invited you in there if you just accept my invite leah that would be amazing i'm also going to bring you on to linkedin youtube Facebook, we are cross promoting. Okay. We just need to mute our computers. And if you're watching, could you kindly tell us if the sound is okay? There's quite a bit of technical stuff going on here because we're going live on so many different platforms. So if you're on Facebook, please just say hello. Let me know if the sound is okay. Just give me a one. If it's dodgy, give me a two. Same for Instagram as well. So, Leah. Leah. How you doing? Hi. 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 Can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear I you can indeed. See. Excellent. Okay. I can't, <laughs> I can't see you on Instagram though. Okay. I thought. Okay. I thought. I can see me on I Instagram. Can see me on Instagram. Instagram. Okay. You're on Instagram now. Yeah. It's just. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah. that sounds great. Excellent. Thank you so Thanks much. So much. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you're on Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> is your phone no, settled? <laughs> yes, yes, it is <laughs> now. <laughs> okay, perfect. So you are a three-time author now. I mean, your book is yet to be released. It's coming out on the 22nd of May. Well, obviously, you received your proof copy on Sunday. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. How are you yeah. feeling about your book? Well, you know, you're obviously seeing it now. Are you happy with it? How do you feel about it? I, yeah, I, I think yeah. this one has been a little bit more complex than the, the, the first two that I did. I don't, 
don't and necessarily know why that is. I don't necessarily know why that is in terms of like, you know, I think it just kind of happened that way. Yeah, um, I'm really, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, 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 I like I'm, all of the books that I've published I, with you. I am very I, happy I with it. Very I am with happy it. with it. I am very happy the, with the look of it, the feel of it, and it's, you know, it's beautiful. I'm really proud of it. Amazing. So obviously this is your third interview with us. So for those who are meeting you for the first time, obviously I know you. Tell us a little bit about you and your background. Okay, well, okay, I'm well, an English I'm teacher first and foremost from a family of teachers. Uh, both my parents are teachers, my sister's a teacher. Um, and one of the things that I always tell my students is something that has really kind of come across in this new book is that everybody has something worth saying and whether they think that it has value or that somebody wants to hear it or not they should still say it um and so I, it's trying to communicate that to my students that saying what you feel and saying what you mean is still very relevant is still very important and so hopefully they will have they will have gotten that um through, through my teaching my and teaching through, through our through lessons our and then and i then put I, it out there my students i tell them they know that i'm a published poet they know that you know i i share my poetry with the world exactly like i tell them they should do you know that i don't just you know and whenever we do creative writing and lessons i write with them and i share their work and i i i share my work and you know, it's, it's, it's a something I will never ask never them to do something I'm not willing to do myself. And so it's one of those kind of mutually supportive environments. I think that's really important. Yeah, so I think both of us are like, well, sick of the idea of the next generation. Not just so sort of teaching the show, for example. Can you just give the audience a little bit of the um, a little bit of, information um, about information the, the about kind of students you work with, what sort of age group are they? Well, I do. I've been teaching for over 10 years. And my students are anywhere from 11 to 18. Um, I teach English, I teach media studies, I teach uh, drama, um, mostly at the moment, my focus is English, uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's really important that I, you know, share that with them. So 11 to 18, and my students are uh, all students who uh, come from challenged backgrounds, so special educational needs, high, high ability, but I uh, just uh, can't cope with mainstream. It's kind of like me. I'm not not really a, uh, a uh, mainstream kind of girl. Kind of girl. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. That's great. And I, I know that you were talking about you know, teaching your poetry or when you have poetry, National Poetry Day, right? Or World Book Day. Yep. You yep. also get yep. involved in the activities with the children. Yep. How have they responded to the fact that you know they're teachers and authors? You know, they're teachers and authors. Well, I mean, well, I've, noticed I've noticed lately, because obviously we have new parents that want to come in and possibly send their student to our school or new students getting a tour around. And I have noticed lately that the tour guides tend to be mentioning that they have a published poet on uh, in the English department when they lead the tour. And I, I run all of the creative writing competitions for my school. Uh, mm -hmm. from the English department. So, you know, so, I, I have no, noticed that I, there is an uptake in mentioning it to people visiting the school. So obviously they're I'm proud of it and, and that makes me feel good because I'm proud of them. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's weird it's, it's for me weird to feel that way, which, you know, that way, which know, the dedication, the dedication in my new book is to anybody who's called imposter syndrome is because, you know, it feels a bit different when it's real. When it's real, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. What you mean. Yeah. And has yeah. got a few messages from Charnette, fellow fellow author, yeah. Conscious Streams publishing author. Hello, lady. She says, "Love your glasses, Danny." Thank you. Notice, so I'm <laughs> very focused <laughs> on. It's taken. I thought it was going to take me a long time to get used to, but it's okay. It's very different to my normal style, but I'm I'm, I'm getting into it. Thanks, Charnette. Yeah. Uh, she also says, "That's wonderful that you're getting that support from your school." Exactly. I think that's so important because, you know. Yes, we're teachers, but there's also so much more you're showing them. That, you know, you know, yes, you teach, yes, you but teach, you also write, and right. your love of literature can also be shown in many different ways. So, has it encouraged them to write themselves? 
Well, I mean, there's this uh, competition that runs every half term called the Young Writers Competition. And we've gotten over 25 students published, you know, wow. in, the young, in, in the Young Writers anthologies. And I, I have a, a memorable kind of incident where one of my students from last year or the year before, um, they had never engaged in that kind of creative writing. They had never been up for writing. And I handed them their letter from the company which offers them publication and they did a little happy dance and it was just like you know they had never had any confidence in their ability to do anything and then they get offered publication and then they're in a book you know and it just it makes the whole thing different and i gave out 26 certificates at graduation last year for, for the writer for the writers who have been published that year and I, like, I love it i love it love it love it I, I gave you, I gave I gave your I website to one of my my uh, GCSE students the other day. He's like, who wants, you know, who wants to hear a teenage girl's poetry? I'm like, oh, I know somebody that wants to hear a teenage girl's poetry. Love that, love that. So um, we've got quite a few people here. So just to say hello to Melissa, another one of our authors. She's going to be interviewed next week. Hello. Nata, Nat, Nata, sorry, <laughs> Yvonne, nice to see you, hello, thank you so much, please do say hello, tap the screen, show us some love, share this if you find this of value and worth, if you're just tuning in, my name is Daniela Blechner, I'm an author, book journey mentor, founder of a company called Conscious Dreams Publishing, we work with authors from all over the world to help to get their powerful messages and stories out there in the form of professional books, so the lovely lady I'm interviewing today is Leah Bailey, who has published three books with us now this one's coming out on sunday uh poet performance poet teacher english and drama teacher inspiring the young people of today so before we kind of cut into uh coffee and paper cups which is the, the title of your your new book let's talk a little bit about your first two books so between foresight hindsight and foresight and chasing apollo just tell us a little bit <laughs> about those two Okay, so the first one, uh, Between Hindsight and Foresight, is a collection that's like a best of. I'd wanted to publish for a very, very, very long time. I've been writing poetry since I was 14. I use it as a kind of therapy, but also an, a, 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 a source of well-being. Because mm -hmm. when, I take, when I take the feelings and experience outside of myself and I pin it to the page, I can deal with it. It's, you know, I can examine it from outside myself. And when I, I've, I've wanted to be published for a long time, and when that became possible between hindsight and foresight, you know, I was really glad because I could share those experiences with someone else. And the key goal in any of my writing, um, but per, I mean, particularly the first one, was to share those experiences with someone who might not be as good with words or know how to say it or know how to put it out there. And therefore, when they see it on the page, like that, that's what I feel. That's what I've been through. It's great. I'm, I'm, I'm not alone. And that, yeah. that thing, you know, and we tend, and there's an irony that that book came out in our lockdown when we're all feeling more alone and we're feeling like we're the only ones out there feeling like this. We're the only ones out there dealing with this. And I, you know, I've had that kind of feeling in cycles since I was a teenager. And we all have. We all get isolated. We all feel that we're the only one. And so there is no higher compliment than anybody can give me. I've had a couple of my readers contact me, you know, I, I feel that, I resonate with that, or that, you know, black, uh, uh, broken mask, or or any, uh, the summer storm, or, or any of the ones in the first book that have felt that it says exactly what they felt, and it, it, it's made them feel a little bit less alone, and that's why I, I love writing. That's what I do. That's the thing. That's the goal. Candy Eddie says, sounds amazing. Hey, Candy Eddie, nice to see you. And I think that's so important. And the reason why I love writing, I started writing poetry the same, the same as you, you know, from a very young age. It really helped me with, you know, understanding who I was. It was really cathartic and, you know, almost like therapy. And I think what I love about you know, being able to write and being able to share what you write, whether it's in a poetic form, whether it's in a book, even through you know, a film or a TV um, idea that you have is like this connection that you form with other people. You know, um, 
this sense of you're not alone, especially if you're talking about you know personal things, you're not alone, you're not the only person going through this. Oh, we've got some lovely questions, so we're going to get to your question in a second. But you spoke a little bit about you know the sense of, of feeling alone, and you know you mentioned lockdown as well, which I think is really important, and actually cutting across all three of your books. So your first book, um, between hindsight and foresight, was written and published or published during lockdown which is when we met you know online we hadn't met so yeah. how was lockdown for you um i i mean obviously that's one of the poems in the new book is obviously i don't want to write about lockdown I don't want to write about it because there was a part of me that didn't feel quite as affected as i felt like i should um, you know, it was one of those things where, of course, I wanted to see family and friends and I wanted to be able to think, but I didn't really care about going out. And everybody's like, oh, it's so horrible. We can't go out. And it's just kind of like, meh. <laughs> you know, I, could it. I could leave it. It's like, meh. <laughs> you know, because, um, you know, everybody's experience is different. And it was, it was nice. I mean, in one way, it brought me closer to my family because I live abroad. My family, my family is back is in the US, US, all of my family is back in the US. US. And, and when everything got into this whole online thing, then I was able to see my family every week. You know, I was more a part of their lives than I'd been the entire time I was living in the UK yeah. because I was seeing them all the time because everybody wanted to. Everybody realized how important it was to do that. And, you know, and that became part of my life and doing the same thing with friends and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. And then you add to that, that I had time to do other things without letting down any of my responsibility. You know, I, 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 there's a part of me that's upset that it didn't upset me, you know, not, not through a, not through an antisocial factor, but just kind of like, when we get back to do it, I'll do it. But, you know, and then there was the online post that just exploded. When you mentioned my spoken word thing, I have to tip my hat to Gary, Gary Huskinson, who does poetry in Peterborough and Coventry, Fire and Dust, and Ooh, Bahive, up in up north, like all these different kind of online open poetry mics became a thing. Yeah, we yeah. did one, didn't we? In, um, yeah, 2021, I think. Yeah, 2021. Yeah, but it became this whole thing. So, like, these open mic nights that I might have been able to physically go to, suddenly there's like one every day, every other day, every week. And I can see poets from, from Australia, from Scandinavia, from, this, from my home country, from the States. I'm, I'm on the same call with people in six different time zones being inspired by fellow poets regularly. You know, so, so you know, it, so it became a ending, ending. Yeah, I mean, well, it's not. It's not ending. It's not ending. We all loved it so much that yeah. now most of the ones I go to are running a live one and an online one so that we can keep that global phenomenon going. It's, it's incredible. You were speaking about the power of, you know, you're living online and forging a community. I know you um, joined D Bailey, Bailey's group, Life in the Lockdown. Um, and yes. we're also part of that book. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Okay, I've got that somewhere over here. She has, they actually have two books. They have an anthology that I wasn't part of because I didn't, I I didn't catch on quickly. That was, that was the life in a lockdown. Yeah. And when you when told me that you had book published book during lockdown, you invited all of us to join the community join group. The community group. Yeah. And so I, I did. And they've been a great help. They've been a great support. Um, one of my, the poems I'm most proud of by Carrie Ashame uh, mm -hmm. came from permission of that group, I guess. I sought permission from them because I felt like I had to. Um, but they also produced a second anthology, which was released. I think January, we had a launch for it in April called Life Out of Lockdown. Lockdown. And these are kind of like, these, these two anthologies, anthologies are like living history. Like living history. There are the stories, the stories and experiences, experiences of, people of people through, through this, this thing, thing that, we that we all live through. through. And it's really and it's incredible because it's people from all different ages, all different backgrounds, all different levels of 
happiness or, or unhappiness or trauma or not trauma and, and surviving it and, and dealing with it. And so these anthologies are really important. They're really powerful anthologies. Lee Daly does all these community events. She's still at it. She's, you know, she's setting up a, a women entrepreneur thing in Luton and, and there was a community hub and she connects people. She's like a spider in the middle of the Like, you know, everybody knows, everybody knows D. <laughs> so, you know, it's, and on all of those things go from one to the next to the next. I'm in the online poetry scene because I met Gary. I met Gary because of D. I met D because of you, and I met I met you because of my friend Julie, who was teaching. So, oh, you know. that's all right. yeah. yeah. See, so, everyone's connected in that sort of way. And I think that's, that's great. I think that's the beauty of you know social media and being online, and you know some of the beauty of lockdown as well. So let's get to it. Let's talk about your new book coming out, Coffee and Paper Cuts. Tell us a little bit about it and how is it different to your, you know, the, the other books that you've published and other work that you've done, um, anthologies that you've contributed to. Okay, well, um, the anthologies, obviously, with the other authors, the 20, 25 other authors or 22 other authors that are in Life Out of Lockdown are... Um, those are various different stories. Some of them are poems, some of them are just uh, prose stories, um, but those are kind of personal individual stories. The first uh, collection I did spans 20 years of, of work. It was a best of kind of thing. My second book that I published with you with the cover that everybody likes is more of a poetic journaling of a, a travel book. Like I went on a trip and my poetry takes you on that trip with me. Coffee and Paper Cuts is different because most of the work in it, now a couple of them are older, but um, like rewritten older poems, reworked older poems, but the, the main the majority of the work was written in the last two years. So all of these things that are going on, all of the emotions and feelings and changes in my existence since becoming a published author, Author, um, since, um, since taking my taking weekly my writing weekly night, writing um, night um, and like writing, writing on a regular kind of not schedule, but like, like more, more regular, regular basis, basis. Yeah. coffee and paper yeah, cuts yeah, kind of chronicles that experience. And there's a lot that's happened in the last two years for everybody everywhere. And some of it is silly and some of it is is serious and some of it is is traumatic and some of it is dramatic and some of it is annoying like you know my my my, my dating ones are particularly particularly show that <laughs> you know I'm, I'm and some of them are written on the inspiration and sometimes challenge of my students there's a sonnet based on a broken washing machine that was quite literally a challenge by one of my students so is Somebody saying that there's a lot of feedback. Um, thanks for letting us know. Is that on Facebook? And is that on one particular speaker? Just let us know. That's mindfully transformed. All right. I don't. If anyone else is on Facebook, please do let us know if it's good as well. Okay. I'm trying to figure out which. And is it on one particular speaker, or is it both speakers? Um, if you're watching on Instagram, please let us know if the sound is good. Please give us a number one, one if the sound is good. Appreciate that. Okay. Thank you for that. So I'm going to carry on. What is the, because to me, I think, I've, you know, I obviously worked with you since 2020, so I've read your work, I've heard your work, thank you. I've heard your work and I, I've seen you blossom and grow. Um, and I, I genuinely think that this is your best work yet so far yeah. for me so far anyway me, and i can anyway, see how you've grown and developed as a poet and obviously you've got prose there as well and you really enjoyed the poems <laughs> tell me what is um which piece are you most proud of and why oh the piece is oh choosing favorite children um mm. it's hard because it's like when somebody asks you um about the most important book that you've read i was in a twitter conversation recently and well, what's the the best nonfiction you've read i don't know if best is the right term but i think probably um the one i mentioned earlier vicarious shame is the one i'm kind of most proud of because it was the most difficult to write 
Tell us um, about that. Uh, what, tell, uh, just give me a just second. Give me a second. Just my just give me a uh, mine should be transparent. Could you tell me is the sound better on my on my voice now? I've popped my headphones in. Um, if you're watching, please say hello. And you find a lot of value and worth. How can you not? Please do share this with your network. That would be fantastic. So if you're joining for the first time, my name is, De my name is Daniela Blackwell, author, book journal, journey, journey, journey mentor, founder of a company called Constantine Publishing, working with authors from all over the world to help get their powerful messages and stories out there. Speaking to the also amazing Leah Bailey, who is a three-time author, performance poet and teacher excellent okay uh, thank you for that and teacher and she's publishing her third book with us called copy and paper cuts which is on pre-order right now but is um released on the 22nd as is her book launch so she's just speaking about one of the poems she's really proud of by Keria shame which i thought was a very very powerful poem so can you tell us a little bit about it and maybe give it a read um okay uh so Obviously, being originally from the States and everything that happened in the last couple of years, you know, when you when you want to be a good ally to movements and to social change, but you don't necessarily know how to be a good ally, but you also don't want to ask because asking kind of indicates that it's someone else's responsibility to tell you how to do something. Mm, yeah. um, it's, it's a really difficult, delicate conversation. Um, it's one of those concepts of like, I want to be a good ally. I want to ask my, my friends who are of color how I can best support the change that is needed for them. But how do you ask that question? How do you participate in that conversation without seeming like some snowflake, some, some oh, aren't I, aren't I a big, important person that I want to help you? Oh, look at how, how, how involved I am. You know, it's, it's, it, it, you want to avoid that because mm -hmm. people, you don't want it to be a show. You want it to be real. And so I was thinking about what, you know, because at a certain point uh, after George Floyd, it's one of those kind of like, if you don't say anything at all, it's as bad as saying something stupid. It's mm. as bad as saying something what? horrible. So silence is just as bad as not speaking. And I'm a poet. I can't stay silent. It's my it's my responsibility not to stay silent. I'm a teacher. It's my responsibility not to stay silent. So, but how do I, where do I start? And so there was this idea, I see what these Karens are doing and what these things that are happening. And I feel shame at their actions, not mine, because I try really hard to be aware and try not to do those things. But at the same time, I look at what they're doing and like, oh, my gosh, how do I how do I, you know, live with that concept of what other people are doing? So, um I, I started to develop the idea and I started to think about, I'm not ashamed of myself, but I am ashamed vicariously for these people that think they have a right, these people that think that they can do that. And so I started to develop this idea and I got about four or five verses in to the rough draft. And I thought, is this, does this do what I want it to do? And, you know, and it's, it's that kind of that self doubt that is this, is this the right way to go? Is this the right approach to it? Um, and I actually, because I was part of that group with uh, D, the community group, which is a very kind of mixed group, you know, and they know me and they know that, that my intentions are pure, my intentions are good, <laughs> that, you know, asking this question was not a expectation of, you know, yeah to yeah. them to educate me so um i wanted i guess i kind of wanted their permission to finish the poem <laughs> and i read the four or five verses that i had and they were quite insistent that i finish it <laughs> so it, it, they were they were more than a little insistent that i finished it so i i thought okay i've been i i, I need to do this correctly i need to do this properly i need to give it everything and so i and, and so i did my best and then when i read it to them when it was finished they're like excellent that's that's exactly what you wanted to do that's exactly you know we knew you could and that you know it says something that's really important and it, it's come up at least four or five times since 
um, in conversation or in you know discussion. I, I wanted to really enjoy Nancy Nancy's um, interview with you the other week because mm -hmm. you know of that conversation specifically with her. Let's talk about race books. So just just if you're just tuning in, for those of you who didn't watch last week, I interviewed Dr. Nancy Dome, who is amazing. She wrote a book called. Um, Let's, Let's talk about talk race about and other hard things. And she spoke about the technique that she's created called RIR. Let me get it. Recognize, interrupt, Recognize, repair, interrupt, and repair, compassionate and dialogue, and how to have difficult conversations rather than to avoid the conversation. Um, so that's, that's, that's it's really, it's really fitting, with fitting with what you're talking about now in terms of being an ally and knowing how to have that conversation and, and, and not stay silent. And will I just say that? Do you mind on your Instagram? Could you just picture your camera just a little bit? So I think the lighting's making it a little bit grainy, and people are missing out on your beautiful face. Mm. Okay. And if you're watching, please do feel free to chuck your questions in as well um, for Leah. That would be amazing. How's that? There you go. Uh, yeah, that's better. Ah, okay. I just because I realized my book was underneath it. So. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so Leah's going to read her poem, Vicarious Shame. And um, yeah, I'll be quiet. I, I, will, I will try to keep it. Keep, keep the emotion out of it it's it's it well so that you can hear it anyway it's impossible to keep the emotion out of it no keep keep it in vicarious shame i am not proud of a history that said for hundreds of years you are property bought and sold treated like animals bred and beaten as less than i a pale shadow I am not proud of laws that said if you could not read, you could not vote. When we never taught the value of words to those too valuable to let free of a pale shadow. I am not proud of those who said separate but equal was good enough without enough of anything that might educate instead of segregate, learning only a pale shadow. I am not proud that a threat to financial pride, Black Wall Street, destroyed 35 blocks, hundreds, thousands of lives, livelihoods. They armed and deputized a pale shadow. I am not proud that team pride stands by the place, the neighborhood where you live. Baseball diamonds only value a color with more talent than a pale shadow. I am not proud that even in war, the ultimate sacrifice, the color of skin seemed to matter more than the color of blood given freely. Uniform honor seems a pale shadow. I am not proud that four policemen could walk away from beating someone for 15 minutes with video and 15 more watching them do it. Justice, it seems, is a pale shadow. I am not proud that at 14, I learned the world stops to hear if a black sports star killed his white wife. But at 12, I didn't know about genocide in a black country, unimportant to a pale shadow. I am not proud that I never read the words of brilliance, poems and prose of all colors. This is not mine but mind the gap, all my reading of only a pale shadow. I am not proud that no matter how badly I want to be a good ally, how ashamed I get vicariously of them, it feels like ashes, like it can only ever be a pale shadow. I am not proud we allowed him, them, to represent us to the world, be seen, as if their hate is all we are, were, would ever be, humanity forever remaining a pale shadow. I am not proud a movement of protest is still necessary, still shunned, still blamed somehow for the ignorance of the murders committed casually by a pale shadow. I am not proud that too many names too many incidents are completely unknown, not seen, not shown, not heard by me or anyone else who looks like me, a pale shadow. 
I am not proud. My own ignorance overwhelms me. The sheer weight of the weight that people carry just to exist makes me ill, a pale shadow. This is what we do in the poetry world. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. That's one of my favorite poems here. And I think it's so powerful. And I think it's, it's, it's brave and courageous of you to, to speak up. And I think, like you say, as a teacher, it's important and a poet to be able to talk about these things. So I've got so much to say about this. But I'm going to go into the poem a little bit. So you talk about this, the pale shadow, you use the pale shadow as a metaphor. Can you just expand? Uh, Mindfully transforms, give me some love. Yeah. If you love that poem, give us some hearts, give us some love. Please share this out. The poem's called Vicarious Shame. The book is Coffee and Paper Cuts, available now online. Um, so give us a bit of context. What 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 was the um the sort of metaphor behind the pale shadow and the repetition? Well, I mean the the pale concept. I mean we pale when we are ashamed of something. We get pale when we're sick. I was sickened by some of the stuff that was happening. Um I was sickened by the idea that I couldn't do anything about it, that I couldn't say anything, that I couldn't do anything that would change anything. And so there is that concept of being pale of fear, being pale of anger, being pale because I am pale. It, it, you know, being, being, I didn't, you know, it, it's not about me being white and these people being black or these people being of color. It was about how any kind of support would feel pale when I don't know enough to do it right, when I want to do it right. And so that metaphor of pale works so much better than white in for me, because it's not just about white and black, it's about color, it's about how we act and how we interact. And so the metaphor worked because it makes me feel that way and I am that way. And therefore it's it's part of that kind of like, I am I'm I'm not proud of those things. I, I am proud of who I choose to be, of, of what I choose to do with what I what I have to, to do with. I, I choose my actions. I try very hard to make sure that I make the right choices, but I'm not proud of those things. The history. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because there is there's this kind of us and them concept with people of color and people who are white. And it's not about that for me. It's not about that I'm white and other people aren't. It's not about mm. white pride or pride in anything else. It's about pride in people's actions or not pride in people's actions, no mm. matter what they look like. Um, and so that 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 concept, that extended metaphor of, of being pale because of these things. And of course, in the poem, I was told by someone that it was that in some ways it was difficult because all of my examples, all of the history that I have in it is from America. It's from my own my own place um but there's part of that towards the end of the poem where it's i don't know enough about the things that have happened in this genre outside of my country i can only speak from what i've i know and have heard in that place um but uh it's in order of the oldest to um the newest for me and once we hit um the 14 year old it becomes my lifetime. And so I tried to put it in historical order. I tried to put it in as, as clear a, a, a kind of imagery as I could using that metaphor to express that this is, it makes me sick. When I see the, when I think about the stuff that was before my lifetime, when I think about the stuff that was in my lifetime, it, it makes me sick that it's still happening, that we need a protest movement. And I, I want to do something about it, but I don't know enough, you know, and as is wanting enough. Thank you. I mean, it's a really powerful metaphor to use. Um, I'm just going to react to some of, um, I've got Pamela here saying that my feedback is pretty bad. Um, <laughs> not sure what to do. I, I mean, I think it's because your speaker is you're coming out of my phone and I uh, and my microphone is on my laptop and I don't I, I don't know how to 
hear you and speak. <laughs> is your is your computer on mute and you're and using your phone, just your phone? Um, hang on. Let's give that a try. There we go. It sounds clear on my end. Um, okay. Pamela, please let us know um, if the sound is okay on my voice. And Leah, if you can say hello. Okay. Thank Hi. you. So Melissa's saying it's good on Instagram. Hi, Andrew. Is it, is it better now? Um, hopefully. It's just difficult with wires, etc. cetera. <laughs> Pamela, let us know if, um, oh, thank you for following. <laughs> let us know if the sound is better on this end. Usually it works best with um, the computer on mute. So we're literally going live in about six different places, YouTube, LinkedIn, two of my Facebook pages, <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> the only place we're not going live on is Twitter. Um, if you have tuned in live and you find this a value and worth, please do follow myself and Leah, Leah at Leah the Dreamer on Instagram and Conscious Dreams Publishing on Instagram. Um, if you're watching via StreamYard, just click the link below or above. Both works fine. Awesome. Thank you so much. Click the link above or below. I'm not sure where it is and subscribe. Do you subscribe and then you can get notifications about when I'm live next again. So sort of cracking into that poem how do you, in, in your mind or that we spoke about this before how do you feel then as an ally uh, is the best way to approach these dialogues and obviously i know that you tuned into dr nancy's interview last week um in your opinion when you see injustices uh, you know this uh, this moment in time you're, you're speaking about the black lives matter movement we're talking about racism but i mean let's put it even in a wider content context, you know, gender or somebody who is not like ourselves or does not have the label that we carry ourselves or maybe doesn't have um, the same challenges. How important, oh, amazing. So someone said, I admire Leah's work since I saw her share at Fire and Dust. Hello, thank you, the LKN Poetry, shout out. <laughs> so, you know, do you think, how, how, how do you sort of, what do you think is the best way to go about speaking about these things and what challenges do you find personally? Well, when, I mean, as a teacher, obviously I have young children, uh, teenagers who are inundated by things all around them, whether that's family or friends or, you know, whatever the media, uh, various newspapers or broadsheets or tabloids or whatever that is mm. influencing what they think. It's difficult as a teacher, because obviously I can't, you know, we're not supposed to kind of push views on mm. them. Um, but at the same time, I want them to think about what they're saying. And so when I see something that gives me pause, when I see something that I am, that makes me uncomfortable, with um, any of these issues, whether it's uh, Black Lives Matter or gender or race or 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 uh, economic, you know, um, any any kind of minority issue, I say something. I don't ever let it pass. I don't ever not call up the student and, or or stop the student and say, "Look, you need to think about what you're saying. You need to think about the room." and what other people in the room have experienced, because there's no way that you can know in a room full of 30 people who has experienced what. Um, I try to get them to think about it in terms of what they don't know. Um, you know, if they choose to have these opinions, they need to be sure that those opinions are theirs rather than just something they heard. Um, it's very difficult to get teenagers to understand the difference between what they see as banter or a joke mm. and um, uh, what they see as banter or a joke and what I know they're just parroting from something they've heard on, on, on YouTube or something they've heard on a TV show or whatever. Um, and it's like, if, if you're going to have that kind of opinion, you need to make sure it's yours and not just something you heard. Um, so I, I yeah. 
Okay, yeah, so getting them to think critically as well. Um, so if someone's just saying on Instagram that they can't hear and they're going to leave and rejoin. If you're watching on Instagram, can you, can you tell us if you're going to hear anything at all now? Um, hopefully you can because you're saying some really powerful things there. And I think having the conversation with young people is, is especially important, especially important because these are issues that are happening now and they're, they're seeing things through the media and some of the, the i can hear both you okay amazing great <laughs> no some of the comments are especially when you look at things like youtube is steeped in ignorance and rowing from one side to the other and i think it's it's so important to open up these conversations and dialogues but well, I, mean, I mean it's 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 one of those things though i don't want to like you know i don't if they're cut if they're getting it from home like i don't want to override their relationship with their family or their relationship with their parents mm. i just want them to like reflect and actually think about where the opinion is coming from and why. And as long, you know, and I may not agree with the opinion, mm -hmm. but if the opinion is coming from them themselves, that is preferable, even if it's something I disagree with. And it's, it's just yeah. trying to get, convince them that they have to think for themselves. And I mean, that's actually true for any educational bit like you know even with like Shakespeare and Macbeth you know I want them to have a original thought you know yeah. but um you know it becomes more important when it's a when it's a social issue um but I also don't want to damage the relationships what you said as well is is very much echoes what Dr Nancy says in her book too let's talk about race and other hard things um talking about having a compassionate dialogue because when you're going in too heavy with your view and you must think how i think you must see it this way you're gonna face resistance but when you come in and you try and understand because sometimes they don't understand where it comes from it's programmed so deep in them and until you kind of get them to unpick where their ideas and thoughts have come from they can start to differentiate between what what they've grown up with or maybe the absence of information or knowledge or what they haven't been around to what actually presenting them with another view so they can actually come up with their own opinion their own thoughts and, yeah. you know, and it, it, it may not it, you know it may not change but at least it has a shot <laughs> um you know it's 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 the how and the why and as an english teacher a literature teacher it's always the how and the why how did it make that happen and why mm. did it make that happen? How did you come to that conclusion? How did you come to that thought, that feeling, that opinion? And why? As long as you can tell me the how and the why and not just because or I heard it or yeah. I saw it on the Internet. As long as, oh, you yeah. can tell me, as long as you can tell me the how and the why. OK, we can leave it alone. But it's it's you know, it's it's it forced it's not going to change anything if i force them to 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 change it's got to be come from them so 100%. you know just just the same as any any topic light stuff from cooking or 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 dating or or relationships or anything not just the heavy stuff but the the light stuff as well and we've got um your lovely the LKN poetry says absolutely forcing is a problem there has to be sensitivity uh, exactly openness is the key in learning love that somebody else uh, jazz hello jasmine one of our authors says as a math teacher this is interesting i always want to see the steps the how so i know how they've worked through the process exactly it's like an equation how do you know what x and y is without understanding how you got to x I've got in two over my head. I'm an English teacher. I can barely remember algebra. But <laughs> I kind of, I understand what I'm saying. How did you get that formula? You know, how did you get the, arrive at that answer? Do you understand the formula, first of all? Um, does that make sense, Jasmine? Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's the beauty of, you know, not being from that particular background because you're privy to, to conversations that perhaps I wouldn't be. You know, I'm sure if somebody had an ignorant comment to say they wouldn't necessarily say it to my face as a as a as a, as a, as a black woman or a person of color they would maybe feel more comfortable and the, the same with you know lgbtq issues you know i hear a lot of things and oh, well, I, 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 I get to the sit down and have the conversations yeah i get the i get the back door into the immigrant conversation because you know and that started when i was really first in this country because oh i don't mean you mm. <laughs> oh i don't mean you they would just go on and on about about 
uh, foreigners and immigrants coming and taking their jobs. I'm like, hello, <laughs> I'm originally from the States. I'm here on a visa. You're talking to, oh, but you're, I don't, I don't mean you, you speak English or you pay your tax. I'm like, it's your language. The word means this. <laughs> I, I, I literally, I was a manager. I used to have people tell me, oh, I don't pay my taxes. All they do is give it to the immigrants anyway. And I'm like, I'm working next to you. You think if I was getting your tax money, I would be working next to you. And it's because of the way it's because I don't look like they expect me to look. Mm. And that's, you know, that really gets you started. That really gets you thinking about per perceptions and, and how people define things, even in their own language, let alone, you know, the language of someone else. That's really interesting. I mean, you know, like we said, when you start to have these conversations, they, they, it, they, they, they're forced to face their own prejudice of, hold on, well, Leah, it's the same as this, but what is it in my mind that sees them as different? Yeah. yeah. And when this become confronted with their own prejudice, it, it sometimes gets the mind ticking and sometimes it doesn't. And like you say, that's OK. That's yeah. OK. Um, somebody says I've experienced pleasant discrimination in poetry. Please expand on that a little bit more. I've not heard of the, the pleasant discrimination. That might be a new term that I'm, I'm going to start to use. Let us know <laughs> a little bit. Um, tell us a bit more about that. That would be great. So I think there's a lot of powerful things that you can do with this poem. Um, I think it's it's a great door to opening up these conversations first with young people and, you know, with, with adults as well. So maybe I'd think about teaming up and maybe doing something online and furthering this discussion. Um, all right. Jasmine says here. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Someone said you don't <laughs> talk or sound black. I cannot stand. What does black? <laughs> So we're just oh my god oh but it's the next just one look at this the, one generic box of how we oh, must talk oh know? but it's the next one look at the next oh you have great vocabulary for an asian which i felt oh but again <laughs> when you echo these things back and when you question them it's that it's then when you start to think that when you come in with you know yeah. resistance and aggression you cause more resistance i think and i think it's it's a great platform to have that openness and compassion and understanding even if you're walking away with completely polar opposite ideas then at least they're your ideas or if you, you've given the other person an opportunity to to understand whether it's their idea or if it's coming from somewhere else i think it's, yeah. it's a great dialogue yeah. so tell us I mean, about is, go yeah there is lighter stuff i will point out in coffee yeah no, no no i was gonna go into that <laughs> about your one of my favorite poems actually well there's there's two but yeah tell us about um effing rice yep do you see did you notice i i put my i put i put my book over here with a an open mark right guess, okay, guess yeah. which one it was two effing oh, effing rice, rice. <laughs> Come on, let's hear let's hear that okay let's let's hear effing rice i i love to cook I love to cook. I love to cook for loads of people. I love to cook. I love to host as part of my, you know, cheesy American housewife training by my mother. It, this idea of hosting and having lots of people. I love to cook. I cannot for the life of me cook rice without like a special bowl and pre-measured things. It has to tell me how many grams of rice and how many milliliters of, of, of water. And water. I have to know exactly how much time, because honestly, every time I try to do it without that, I'm absolutely stuffed. And it's so frustrating that I can cook for like 40 people at Thanksgiving dinner and I cannot cook one bowl of rice. <laughs> I'll come so around. That, I'll show you as long as I can have some of your dinner. Uh, well, absolutely. Um, you are always welcome at Thanksgiving dinner. But uh, the the um, the thing about and so I, I kind of express that frustration at stupid little things that should be easy that aren't. Um, so F and rice. Why? Why can I get it? Watered and measured. Still no good to fit food most treasured. Rice. F and rice. Uh, I burn or I drown, soggy. Um, I burn or I drown, soggy white paste. I fret and I frown. Oh, what a waste. Rice, effing rice. Dinner for 12, sure. Multiple different dishes, no matter what it's for, but no help for wishes with rice. 
effing rice. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what I love about your book. It's such an eclectic mix of, of different, you know, you've got the hard topics, uh, the topics that really make you think, and then the, the fun ones like that. And you've got these beautiful images here, if you can see. Uh, Leah loves this ah. app that she uses, <laughs> which we also um, <laughs> use to get uh, to create this book cover. Um, so photos that you take um, and then turn them into what look like watercolour paintings. Love mm. it. So yeah. I've got a few more questions. We've only got a few more minutes left. So what we haven't mentioned is that you have an audio version of this coming out very soon, towards the end of May, possibly June. Uh, we're still working. Oh, please do try and come on Sunday, Jazz, um, Jasmine. I love it when our authors all meet as well. It's in Wimbledon. Try and come down on Sunday, seven to seven till late. Yeah. Um, yep. There'll be so a piano player, and you know, it's where I do my writing. So. Awesome, awesome. So tell us a little bit about the audio book. Well, how's that experience for you? Because you've, you've obviously never done an audio book before. It's your first experience. Yeah, it was it was a new experience. I have a, a new respect for people that talk into a microphone for a living. <laughs> um, it was it was made really easy by the lovely uh, prof and 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 Peaches speaks. Um, you know, they and Kingship Studios, I think, is where we where we did the actual yeah. recording. Um, you know, they made it really low key. They made it really easy um, because, you know, I'm there standing, reading my poems, which I've never done before to record forever. And I hate the sound of my recorded voice. I really do. I don't know. I don't know anybody that actually likes the sound of their recorded voice. Um, and it was hilarious. I have a, a an old friend who records um, books by other people. So he, he, they're, they're a voice actor. And they're like, yeah, see, you know, at least it's your poem. So at least you know, at least you know what emotion is supposed to be in it. I'm like, yeah, okay, respect. <laughs> but, so, I mean, you know, it was four hours and it was... Uh, very tiring, but also very satisfying. Um, yes. <laughs> well, it was four hours to record. It's not going to be four hours long. I promise. It's not going to be a four hour long book. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, I mean, on I average. Mean, I case. can talk. I can talk. I can talk the business, but it's not a four hour long book. <laughs> um, it's, a it's about 127, 20, 130 pages, four hours worth of work. Um, of course, it's as it's going to be about an hour, um, but it does take a while. It does take a while to get it right. And I think you've done such a great job. And I can't wait to, to get this out for you. Um, if, well, oh. I mean, I was I had one of my beta readers when I had the first draft of the audio book that I was listening to. One of my beta readers was around and she was listening to it and got a little misty eyed at one of the more emotional poems. And, you know, that was really strange because obviously she'd read it half a dozen times, but hearing it in my voice was different. Totally different. And, it's you know, and so that was a new experience. When we worked on your first book over lockdown and then obviously the, I hadn't met Leah at all. And I met Leah for the first time in October um, when we were looking at the venue. And you introduced me to the venue, which is where she writes a lot of her poems. Uh, and then I heard you read the poems, and I was like, it just gives it that extra dimension, which is why I think audio books are so important. Um, I've started listening to so many audio books, mainly because I have to read so much. Number one for my work, number two, I just love reading, but I, I need to to listen as well. So this audio book's coming out soon. We're going to be rolling out audio book services. So if you're one of our authors, um, we're going to start officially in June. Uh, do come and see us as well, Leah. Obviously, I've done my book as the pilot. So Leah is our very first client publishing her audio book. Look out for that coming out end of May, June. We've got a few minutes left. So tell us a little bit about your book launch on Hey D Bailey. We've been speaking about you. You've got to watch the replay. We've been bigged up a lot here. Oh, Kenny Harry, who's also one of our authors, his book is on the shelf here, Being Invisible. So proud. That's an absolutely beautiful book. Men of Colour Men of Color Talk About Love, Life and Fatherhood. Jasmine's also on. She's written The Unseen Veil. Had her book launch last month. Amazing book launch. Come to the launch. Um, come to the launch. Come to Party the launch. Someday. Come to the launch. <laughs> Kenny says he would come, but it's, but it's his birthday. Oh, Kenny. <gasps> no. Soon. No, yeah, it's, it's my birthday. birthday. 
It's my birthday. Of course, it's your birthday on the 22nd too. My authors have the same birthday. Hey, That's awesome. Exciting, isn't it? <laughs> That's why I have them at the Love party that. on the birthday though. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. tell us a little oh, d's coming yeah yeah tell us a little bit about the book launch then we've got about two we've got a little bit over time but it's all good tell us a bit about the um, book launch Okay, so this is a place where I do my most of my writing. I have a weekly writing night that I kind of carve out for myself. I allow myself. Sometimes I don't get anything done. Sometimes I get nothing done. Sometimes I get four poems written. It depends on the atmosphere. It depends on how I'm feeling. But the book launch is going to be held in a place called Birdie's Bar. Birdie's Bar is underneath a Green King pub called Prince of Wales. So it's all Green King, but it's this separate space that reminds me of a New York basement bar. And it's got the brickwork and the atmosphere and the lovely staff that always take care of me. And so, you know, it's and there's uh, on Thursday nights, there's a live piano player, which there will be at the party on Sunday. Um, But the the kind of place uh, with the book launch, I will have my books. I will have all of my books available to purchase. I have some merchandise to go with my books that is available to purchase but mostly it will be just a poetry party just i will do some readings i will discuss it with people uh i will i will discuss it yes there is a bar it will be staffed there will be drinks i I, I have made sure that the yes i have made sure that there is a staff member behind the bar to help you out in case my drinks aren't enough there will but there will be poetry and books and a raffle um a raffle for uh po- poster prints of the illustrations from my books um and a raffle for a free copy of my book so lots of co- of stuff going on lots of enjoyment and 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 fun sharing the uh experience of poetry amazing and i just love live events that's something i did i didn't really miss the social aspect of like going out and it just such it was such a lovely time just to chill out and just dress from the waist up and that's it but it um you know i love live events i love book launches i love organizing events and this this event we organized leah's last book launch with this event leah said i want to have a guest you're a guest i'm coming as a guest for the first time so yeah i'm excited um, is it baby friendly? Jazz is asking. I know that it is dog friendly. One of my friends is one of my friends is bringing her dog. Um, we'll find is, out. We'll we find have out. the we have the place we have the place to ourselves. There, you know, it's yeah. it's a public. Obviously, it's a public event, but you you have to register for your free ticket in advance. This this place is not usually open on a Sunday, so we have the place all to ourselves. So it, there won't be random football people coming from upstairs football people <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm i'm pretty sure it is because it's a, a private space downstairs but yeah. we'll, we'll find out we'll it's comfortable it's, 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 it, yeah it's comfortable it's it's safe um you know it's it's i think i think it's probably is fine for for children and that will be your baby's second book launch <laughs> all right so kenny says that's my after party sorted. Oh, come down, Kenny. Come down. Absolutely. We'll absolutely. Book launch is done and hopefully we can get one done for you, for your book. I'm really excited about your book as well. Um, Yeshiba, well, another one of our authors coming on, Clever Chrissy is her book coming out in June. She says, congrats, Leah. Love love the poetry part idea. Awesome. Um, I think, yeah, uh, Yeshiba, you'd really enjoy her poem that she read out earlier on if you watch the replay called Vicarious Shame. I think that's right up your alley. Do come to the book launch if you can as well. So what we'll do, or what Leah will do, is she's going to pop the link to the book. I pop the link to the book in um, on the Facebook feed. If you could pop it into uh, the other feeds uh, as, along with the book launch link, that would be amazing. If you want to buy a copy of the book, Leah has, um, if you follow her on Instagram or at Leah the Dreamer, you have a link tree, don't you? Yes, I you do. Have a, link, do you want to Leah, explain it? Leah, Leah the Dreamer, Leah the Dreamer link tree will take you to all of my social media, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and places to buy the book and any events that I do, including the one on Sunday. So like link tree is my, my new God. It is, it is it's everything, everything in one place. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so if you could pop that link on the feed as well, um, people hop over there get a copy of the book, con- connect with Leah. If you uh, if you have a radio show or a podcast, just to get in contact with Leah as well. 
and um, invite her on. That would be amazing. And um, hopefully we'll see you all at the launch. Jasmine, you need to book your interview with me. We need to do another one. So <laughs> thank you everyone so much for joining. Wow, we went for the full hour and four minutes. Tune in <laughs> next Wednesday, 7 p.m. GMT. GMT, yeah, 2 p.m. EST, I think it is 2 p.m., where I'll be interviewing our new author, Melissa Martin, who's written a book called My Mirror, My Reflection, My Depression. A uh, very powerful testimony of her own story. My journey from depression to finding my purpose. I just love that cover here. And I really love that we've got um, lots of our authors on as well. I do encourage you all to connect with each other, you know, do your own events together. Invite me, of course. You know, help support each other, promote each other. This is very, about, very much about community building and, and connection and, and supporting each other as self-published authors. It's not easy out there. Hey, sharing banana. Uh, no problem. Uh, Jasmine says, yes, I'll email you, Danny. Awesome. Can I buy at launch? Yes, you can buy a book at the launch. Yeah, all of my work will be available. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been a lovely interview. Really lovely seeing, seeing you again, Leah. Um, I love I love working with you, Danny. There's there's I I will I I you always make it easy. Thank you. I appreciate that. We love working with you too, and I'm really excited about your audio book. Can't wait to get it all uploaded and, and, and done for you. So we will see, or I will see you on Sunday at Bertie's Bar in Wimbledon, and hopefully, if you're watching, I will see you there as well. Have a beautiful evening. Bye.